sought after course. Uh, and the, the other thing too is it's a small course. Um, just think of it this way. Like I said earlier, it's a, you're really essentially the jack of all trades, master of none as a JTAC. Um, and here's a little bit of background on me. Uh, the seven years in the United States Air Force, I'm an MQ-1 sensor operator, so a bit, I fly those big, huge, freaking remote control airplanes that everybody likes to read about in the news. Um, I've been to Afghanistan once. I've shot a shitload of Hellfire missiles, and I have a lot of experience working with JTACs. Um, with that said, within my career field, I'm also a, an instructor. I'm an air crew instructor. I have 1,700 combat, uh, 1,700 hours of combat experience, and roughly about 500 hours of instructor experience. So I kind of know how to teach uh, this kind of stuff. Not so much basic soldiering skills, but I can call in airstrikes fairly well, I think. Um, now, segueing on to the next portion of this is what is a JTAC? All right, so I get a lot of people that ask these questions on what it is to be a JTAC, what kind of relationship do we have with the ground force commander and the, you know, what we do as a JTAC, how we can influence our, our capabilities onto the battlefield. Um, with that said, think of it this way. All you are as a JTAC is your deconfliction measure from not killing friendlies. That is the only thing that you are as a JTAC. Your whole entire sole mission is to deconflict ground fires from your friends so you don't kill them. Everything else is just freaking cool points. Um, we'll go into further detail in a little bit. Uh, but what I mean by deconfliction with other or with friendlies in general is that as a JTAC, your sole responsibility is controlling the battle space above you and on the ground. All right. So if you know that friendlies are about to assault the town, you're not going to call an airstrike on that position, right? Obviously, you don't want to kill your friends. Uh, but that also translates to deconfliction within the airspace. You don't want two aircraft flying at the same altitude and employing a GBU-12 through another aircraft's altitude. Uh, so deconfliction and making sure that you are in far separation from other aircraft or other assets is very paramount to this, uh, to being a JTAC. In fact, I would say that's about 75% of their training is just, just avoiding killing friendlies. Because, um, as you know, a GBU-12 or a 500-pound bomb has about a blast radius of about 600 to 800 meters with shrap. So very important that you know your weapons and you know what kind of effect that you have on the battlefield. Um, and then further on from there, we'll talk about the history of a JTAC and the equipment. All right, so I get a lot of people that ask, you know, what's a, what's a forward air controller, what's an AFAC, what's a FAC-A, what's a JTAC, a TAC-P, combat controller. Um, so how many of you guys have seen We Were Soldiers just by, not even a show of hands, just by yes or no? Who's seen We Were Soldiers? Yeah, I've seen it. Yep. Okay, so you know that guy that calls in the napalm strike and he gets his buddy, shot, you know, covered up in napalm? That guy was a forward air controller. Um, so just to put it this way, forward air controllers have been around in the sense that they are now since about World War II and Vietnam. Um, but within the last 10 years or so, the standardization between the training of all branches have come together within our multinational corps. So, uh, so you take a guy that is a JTAC certified individual in the real world. It doesn't matter if he's a Dane or if he's you know with the German Army or if he's a Canadian JTAC. If you are a JTAC, it is a NATO designation that you are a Joint Terminal Attack Controller, which means that as a certified JTAC and you are within our coalition, I should be able to push you to any air asset that is capable of employing ordnance under the 3093 JPUB uh, or the Joint Firepower Application uh, format. What I mean by that is any JTAC with that call sign as a JTAC should be able to control any aircraft within our inventory to basically affect the target. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So th that's really kind of the flaw with ARMA um, because they say JTAC, right? Which JTAC's a, a certification. Um, but if I'm a combat controller, my job as a combat controller is a little different than being a, a TAC P. Um, as a TAC P, my main concern is going to be the ground infantry forces that are more conventional. Just think TAC P's are going to be more conventional forces. Also, you have pararescue that can be JTAC certified, whether they're embedded with an army unit as a medic or, you know, as an extension as a JTAC. Um, Really, the title as your your job as a title as a combat controller or attack P dictates what you do in that organization, but your certification as a JTAC gives you that that clearance or that that know-how of actually applying that power. So as a JTAC, I can call in an airstrike, I can clear out an airfield. It's just really a way of telling everybody who you are and what your capabilities are, not really what your job title is. 
Um, I, a little clear as mud, but I'll get into more detail on that in a little in a little bit. But we, we're kind of behind schedule, so I'm kind of go through this as fast as I can. Um, and that really goes into title versus position. When you carry yourself as a JTAC in the primary server, what I want you guys to think of yourself as an extension of the ground force commander. And what I mean by that is basically if the ground force commander says, all right, how many air assets do I have? I have, you know, one by eight, six, I have an Apache or I have an A-10 or a Harrier. I need to know what I can do with that aircraft to affect the battlefield. Um, in the in the desired intent of the ground force commander. So what I mean by that is, if the ground force, uh, I'm sorry, if the ground force commander says, okay, I have two A10s and there are three T60s out in the open, I'm probably going to want to use those A10s because they're pretty good at killing tanks instead of sending out AT4s with riflemen, you know, uh, as AT to go engage these T60s. I'm going to want to use a more powerful asset. And that's really where you come in as a JTAC. Um, now let's take go ahead and switch to your map real quick. So let's use our position now at this uh, at grid 4920 break 1004 at the hangar that we're at as our let's call this our CP. Oh my god, that's annoying. What's that? Oh, uh, Zamort like calling out enemies and shit over global. <laughs> um so let's call this our uh our I guess our HQ for now. And reference grid 040107, the hangars to the northwest of the airfield, that's our enemy position. All right, so this is what we're going to reference from here on out as our CP in relation to the enemy. Uh, you can, can go we and mark it? Yeah, I'm go and mark it. Absolutely. That's what your map tools are there for. Um, so as a ground force commander, let's say hypothetically that there was there are three T-60s over there and we have a platoon sized element located at this position. Um, obviously, we're going to want to take out or neutralize those those targets before we push through their AO. Um, but with that said, we have many options. I, as a ground force commander, would have many options in how to neutralize that target. Me personally, I'm going to want to go the most conservative route and try to not get my friendlies killed. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is probably going to be air power. Um, it's more effective. It scares the shit out of the enemy, and you get your job done way faster. It takes me, it takes me less time to actively engage T60s or anything in the open with air power because they're moving at 300 knots than it is to move, a, you know, a squad-sized element to flank and hit them with AT from 500 meters away. Uh, obviously, you guys have experience in primary server, so you know what I'm talking about. Just to get people yeah, to move in this game takes a long time. Um, as opposed to being able to call in an A-10 on that is obviously just a little faster. Um, but really, the, the next portion that I'd like to talk about is really where we fit in as JTACs into the whole battle. Um, do we fit in at the company level? Am I going to be next to the CEO? Or am I going to be at the squad level with the dudes, on, you know, the ground pounders that are kicking in doors? Really, it's up to the mission. All right. If the mission's dynamic and you're going to have more situational awareness and you have a high chance that you're not going to get yourself killed, I personally would like to be embedded with the troops on the ground at the front of the lines. Um, but with that said, it's a juggling act because if you do that and you get yourself killed, well, obviously you just lost your JTAC. And it's kind of a juggling act, like I said. So that's a determination that you're going to have to come up with as a JTAC and say, hey, Ground Force Commander, I've got you on long range. I, you've got an RTO embedded with this squad. I'm going to go out with these guys because I can see the enemy better, as opposed to a Ground Force Commander who is getting relayed information by squad leaders and basically getting a half picture, as I like to call it. If I can see three T-60s out in the open and we're in visual contact with them and their Ground Force Commander is like a click away, I'm going to be able to call in for clearance from the Ground Force Commander via radio a lot faster than it is for me to get those coordinates from the guys on the ground. Um, so take it for what it's worth. Use that, use that as a tool for you. How effective are you going to be as a JTAG is completely up to you. So you need to go out and get experience and get yourself killed once, you know, once or twice to really just know where you are, where you're going to fit. I'll give you my personal outlook on it. If I can, like I said, I'll go out into the squads. If I can affect, if I can affect the battlefield positively without getting myself killed, I'll hang out with the company commander or whoever the highest echelon leadership is. Um, so that's a determination that you guys are going to have to make, or that's a limitation that the ground force commander is going to have to impose on you. So, what have we covered so far? Who are we as JTACs? What we do, and where we fit in. Now we're going to talk about how we're going to affect the battlefield and what we use to do that. All right. So not talking about equipment. We're talking about standards and communication here. 
as a JTAC, your number one tool, I don't care if you have a SOFLAM or a Vector2 or you have the most SA in the world, if you cannot talk to your aircraft, you're useless as a JTAC. All right, communication is the number one weapon as a JTAC. Your radio is the most important item that you carry with you. Um, with that said, communication is very paramount. So what are we, uh, let's get into more of the uh, discussion with that. Uh, so we have a check-in procedure that normally happens, what's called a fighter to fact. All right, and what does that mean? When I get a fighter to fact, let's say two A-10s are checking on station, and I'm located with a ground force commander on the ground, and we're about to push on to this objective, I need to know how many aircraft I have, where they're at, how long, how long they're going to be on station for, how much how much ordnance that they're carrying with them and what their capabilities are. I need to know if they can see the target. I need to know if I can give them a ground uh, or talk on, a visual talk on to them. I need to know how much situational awareness do they have on the battlefield. Um, I need to know all that information. That's in the form of fighter to fact. Uh, once we get out of here, I'll reference you guys to that in the thread, but because I, I don't want to alt tab right now, we'll just talk about it. All right, so fighter to fact. This is where the pilot communication course that I want to implement is going to come into play later. But for now, let's just play that you already know their loadout. Let's say you've got, you know, uh, you've got Apaches and A-10s, and you you need to know, or you know what they have. Obviously, an Apache's probably going to have a gun, and A-10's probably going to have a gun. Uh, nine times out of ten, any air asset that's going to be affecting you or working with you is going to have some sort of direct fires, meaning that he's going to have a gun. Um, with that said, some aircraft might have GBU-12s, laser-guided bombs, 500-pounders. Um, we'll get into that later. But a standard loadout, just think I want to use that gun first. I want to use indirect fires. I want to use the most basic form of firepower that I have because I can direct that better. Um, but the ch but, but as a JTAC, what you're going to need to pass to the aircraft is obviously, like I said, it's a fighter to fact. So now we're going to go into the fact to the fighter or the, ch the situation update. Um, this, will, this is also in the thread that I, that's posted or the, the post that I linked into the channel. But just think of it this way. He's going to tell you who you are, and you're going to tell him who you are. So you're going to say, hey, uh, this is my call sign. So let's say, for example, today my call sign is Fluffer69. Fluffer69 is current qualified JTAC. I am at this position. This is the company size element that I'm located with, or I need to tell them how many people that I'm with. So let's say I'm with a squad size element. I'm with the ground force commander. We have 48 people total on the ground. We're currently pushing objective one at grid. 010020 that's a hypothetical grid but let's just say that that's where you're pushing that's our objective so they can plot that on their map and anticipate that if we're going to engage anything it's probably going to be in that area and you're going to say all right uh basically you're going to tell them uh let's see what i have in my notes you're going to say all right for the situation update who you are what you're doing um, what your intent is. You're going to say, hey, if we take contact from this village or this town or this objective, expect that this is the type of fires that we're going to request from you. You're going to say, you're basically going to tell them, are you going to want suppressive fires? Are you going to want, you're going to want to actually eliminate the target? Two very different definitions. If I'm suppressing the target, I don't really need to actually shoot the target. If I'm actually wanting to kill the guys on there, it's pretty important that I put a GB-12 or a gun run directly on that target. So you need to let them know what you're expecting out of them if you take shit or if you need them to actually engage those targets. Um, from that point, you're going to say, basically, here, I'll give you guys a good example, a good fighter to fact. Give me five seconds. All right, so I'm sure most of you guys clicked the video that I linked in channel, but this is going to be a standard check-in procedure, all right? So this is a on a very basic level who you are or what aircraft is talking to you and what you or you as a JTAC talking to the aircraft. So let's say that he gave you a fighter to fact check-in. Let's say that you have all of his information. You know his altitude. You know his ordinance. You know his time on station. You know how many aircraft they are. You know, you know what type of capabilities. If they can self-laze. If they can. If they need a fighter to fact talk on. This is a situation update. All right. 
So the way I like to give situation updates to fixed wing aircraft is I like to call it Alpha 1, Alpha 2, Alpha 3. So this is situation update Alpha 1, meaning it's probably the first of the first situation update that I'm giving you. The, so basically what it's called as a TTFAC OR, target, or I'm sorry, threat target, uniform friendly, artillery clearance authority, ordinance requested, restrictions, and remarks. All right. So this is situation update Alpha 1, threat activity. Three by T-60s in village, you know, in village, uh, what the fuck? I don't know. Village Houston. Let's call it that. A village Houston, Scott. Also, a platoon-sized element of enemy infantry. Um, friendly situations are grid 042055. Um, company-sized element with roughly about 45 to 60 personnel on the ground. All our artillery is cold. Gun to target line and max wardens for artillery will be passed if it goes hot. Clearance authority is through fluffer 69. Ordnance requested per nine line. Restrictions, remarks, and rem uh, restrictions and remarks per nine line. So what have I basically just told you? I told you who the enemy is, how many people there are on the ground. If there is going to be fires or uh, ground-based fires like artillery or mortars that's going to affect the airspace, I'm going to tell them that where it's going to go and where I need to deconflict them to. I'm telling them who is controlling them. I'm telling, basically, I'm telling them who's going to be clearing, clearing them hot to engage targets on the ground. And then following that, I'm going to tell them what kind of ordinance I'm requesting and restrictions or remarks are basically based off of the nine line that I'm going to be passing. Obviously, I'm sure you guys have all heard of a nine line, and that's where we're going to flow into next. Um, but let's talk about getting into the nine line and the procedures for that. So let's say as a JTAC on the ground, company sized element we're taking fires from the previously established grids at 040107 to the northwest we're oriented to the southeast of the target roughly let's call it 800 meters give just a rough guesstimate i haven't even looked at it with my vector yet what how am i going to basically employ ordinance on that target anybody give me a quick example of what they how they think i should employ ordinance on it Let's say we have two A-10s on station. They're circling ahead. They're watching the firefight. Uh, what type of target are we trying to dispatch here? Three T-60s on the ground that are engaging us. Uh, well, you have two the, A-10s. Uh, gun runs? A gun run? A GB-12? GB it really yeah. depends on the ordinance, right? So if you have indirect fires, yeah, use them. You use what you have to the maximum extent. Um, oh, the, fuck, uh, Mork. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, GAU Avenger on the uh, Warthogs is good for uh, a T-72, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, yeah, that plane the, was designed to blow yeah, up tanks, the tank wasn't buster. it? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah okay. so Depleted let's say it's not around. even that. It's an Apache, but they have Hellfires. Hellfires Ooh, are perfectly designed. Hellfires. They're designed perfectly to employ against targets of uh, armor. Um, but with that said, let's say it's infantry. And you have a squad size element that's ambushing you from that position. Uh, and let's say that you want them to be neutralized. It doesn't matter, not eliminating them, neutralizing, whatever you want, but you have an A ten. Does it really matter that you actually hit them? Probably not, because you're gonna about you're gonna unload probably about three hundred rounds of thirty mic mic into that whole entire area. So they're probably gonna get hit by something. Um, so uh, question. Yeah, go ahead. With the uh, A ten in Arma specifically be able to uh, engage uh, infantry effectively with the main gun or is the accuracy Absolutely. not great enough? Yeah, no, it is. It's it's great in that fashion and the reason why I say that is it's complete. well, half of it's pilot competency so if the pilot sucks then it doesn't matter what weapon you have on the aircraft but let's say that you have a good pilot and it's a good day and your entire mission is to basically suppress those fires while you maneuver a ground element to attack them from a flank flanking position then obviously if all you want to do is suppress them it doesn't matter if you hit them of course if i stop talking it's because the global chat or the group chat with zamorg is kind of interrupting me um so let's get into nine line implements and control types so we have a nine line right so anybody that's got somewhat of experience dealing with the nine line who can tell me what it is um, I guess it's basically uh, tells the aircraft everything he needs to know to uh, put ordnance on target. 
Okay, yeah, that's good. So it's a standardized format that I can give to any aircraft and basically orient them to a target, right? So I can basically take any target, use this nine line, and pass him that information. He's going to know what I'm talking about. So is it basically a checklist you have to follow to the line? And you I wouldn't really say it's a checklist. a checklist. It's more or less like an uh, order. Hold uh, on. Fluffer posted a really that. good picture. I'll get it for you. Yeah, how go does the, uh, How does the nine line fit in with a, uh, a situation report? Like, would it... Hey, well, you don't pass a nine line with a situation report. Right, no, I understand that. But I'm saying, like, how... Uh, how does it fit under that rubric? Like, do you pass a nine line for each separate target or engagement you want to employ, or you want to you want the uh, A10 to or the a nine line is the the act of calling in the airstrike. So it's when you're physically talking to the pilot, saying like, "I want you to kill this. This is how you do it." Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's talk more into that. So we have what's called control types. All right. So think of it this way. Control types are the restrictions. So when I say restrictions or remarks, I um, it's usually because I'm giving them a certain type of uh, type control. So just think of it this way. Type, if you guys have a piece of paper, it's also in the thread or that post that I that I put up. But just think of it this, down, this way. The low down skinny on type one control is just restricting the aircraft. All right, that's all it is. Type one control is basically so you have three types. You have one type one, type two, type three control. Type one, just think of it this way. You, as the JTAC, can visually see the target, and the aircraft can visually see the target. That's really all type one control is. It's the most restrictive because you're basically giving him, you're saying, hey, I see the target. I need you to basically, I need you to tell me that you see the same target that I'm talking about. All right? Type two control. Either the employing aircraft or the designator sees the target, meaning that I as a JTAC can visually see three T-62s in the open, but the aircraft can't at this time. All right, basically what it means is that at, when he's on his final attack heading, because I've given him some sort of restriction, it should line him up into being able to employ his ordnance on that target. So let's say that with the Type 2 control, I've given him a certain grid. Let's say it's at those uh, that, that hangar at 040-107. I can visually see that target, but the employing aircraft does not see that. But he has that marked on his map to where he can basically use his instruments to get his eyes on that target while he's on a final attack heading. Um, it's one or the other. Let's say that, hey, he says, hey, J you know, Fluffer 69, I've got th eyes on three TCC2s northwest 800 meters from your position. He gives you the grid. He says, grids are 047107. Eyes at JTAC do not see that, but I trust him as an A10 that says, hey, yeah, I'm, you know, I see it. Uh, three T-62s in the open, or for another good example, let's say, hey, I'm being engaged by a Shilka, a ZSU-23 at grid 040107, the A-10 is. I'm seeing tracer fire from that location, and you want him to attack that ground-based target. You give him that as your Type 2 control. Um, now, moving on, Type 3 control. Let's say, what's Type 3 control? Type 3 control is basically where you do not see the target and the aircraft does not see the target. It's the least restrictive t control type, meaning that you are in a position to where you are not going to be affected by the ordinance. So type three control is basically saying that, dude, free reign on that target until it's dead. Um, the difference is type one, type two are, are done. Your, the clearance is cleared hot and type three is a clear to engage. Type one and type two controls are for one passes only. Let's say that I want to drop one GBU-12 on that target. That is what I'm going to clear him for. Type 3 control, let's say there are a column of T-62s in the open. Let's say that there's eight of them, and that we are well separated from him. I'm going to give him a restriction that says, hey, you know, Hog 1-1, Fluffer 69, do not go further south than the 105 northing. Can you guys reference that on your map? So you look at your grid lines, you have the 105 northing, which is south of the hangars that we we're talking about at 047107. You guys see that? Yep. Okay, so you take that 105 northing, you go everything, 
everything to the south of that that's considered that friendly airspace. So our location is south of the 105 Northing. Everything to the north is a 105 Northing. You say, hey, dude, we're going to be holed up here for about 30 more minutes. Any targets of opportunity to the north of the 105 Northing is declared hostile at this time. He says, hey, dude, I've been looking around north of the 105 Northing at that grid. I see eight T-62s in the open. That would be a good example of giving them a Type 3 control. Basically saying, hey, dude, all right, you have eight times T-62s under your crosshairs north of the 105 Northing. I know that you're going to be well deconflicted for me. Dude, free reign. And we'll go into the actual application of that, but that's an example of Type 3 control. So it's kind of like just, uh, just telling him that, uh, all right, here's your targets. Uh, how you deal with them is up to you. Absolutely. Okay. You're going to give him one, some sort of restriction, though. You're going to say, hey, do not go south of the 105 Northing. You're going to say, hey, get your clock out. Hack it from now. Ten, mi ten minutes from now, all engagements will be complete because we're going to be pushing north of this target. All right, so you're going to give them some sort of restriction that says, hey, do not engage this target from this point or after this point. Um, you Be creative with it. Use you know, use your ingenuity. If, uh, if you want to give him type 1 control because you want him to restrict the amount of ordnance that he's employing, let's say that he's only got a limited amount of ammunition, um, you give him type 1 control and say, hey, uh, type 1 basically saying, or type 2 control, I'm sorry. Type 2 meaning that he sees, he visually sees the target, or let's say that you see, visually see the target. You say, hey, uh, Hog 1-1, one, one, uh, Fluffer 6-9, you know, you pass on the 9 line, which we'll go over in a little bit. But you basically say, hey, dude, I see the target, or you see the target. I want you to give me one gun run pass. We're going to see how effective your target or your engagement was. If you hit the target the first time, I'm going to clear you hot again. I'm going to give you more clearance to engage that same target. Um... That's basically the low down skinny on type type controls. Are you guys uh, pretty familiar with that now? Do you have any questions? Ask them. Take that as you guys are all now experts with type type one, type two, type three control. Here comes your exam. Just kidding. Um, just the way I can recommend this, guys, is I would use type two the most. All right. Type 1 is a little too restrictive, and I don't think you guys are going to be on par with using Type 3 control until, like, that's, Type 3 control is more or less like that bachelor, or I'm sorry, that doctorate level cast that I was telling you guys about earlier. All right, so Type 3 control, just think of it more advanced. Type one, uh, type 2 control being where you basically want to be. Type 1 control, let's say that you know shit have enemies like 300 meters away from your position, and you need to, you basically don't want to kill yourself because you're in a position to where you might get hurt, you might get hurt by the ordnance. Um, so you're placing more restrictions on the aircraft so you don't kill yourself. Just think of it that way. Make sense? Clears mud. And so basically, the uh, main difference you're saying between one and two is that uh, with one. Everybody can see uh, the target, and mm -hmm. with two, maybe you see it, but the aircraft doesn't. Exactly. Or the aircraft okay. sees it and you don't. Let's say that you, you know, that aircraft says, "Hey, dude, I visually see enemies in the open at this grid." That's all I need to know. If I can make sure that friendlies are not there, and they're a declared enemy, I go talk to the ground force commander and I say, "Hey, dude, those A-10s that are patrolling up there, they've got eyes on a, a freaking squad-based element or squad-based enemy element that's moving on our position. They're about, you know, this distance away from us. Do I have permission to engage?" He's like, "Yeah, dude, fucking A. That why didn't you tell me that earlier?" So that's a good effective way of being a good asset to the ground force commander. Is you know that guy is at that A-10s at you know two, three thousand feet or so, and so he can, can visually he has a, he yeah. can see everything. So you use those as an extension, you know, you see those, you use that as a, no shit, if I had a God's eye view of what I was looking at on the ground, I could basically see that. Quick question about Type 1. Mm-hmm. Uh, would the JTAC, uh, would he be able to, or should he have eyes on the incoming aircraft before he clears them hot? Yes. Um, yeah, and that's the biggest thing is that you, you visually see the target or, and you see the aircraft employing it. That Thanks. is basically type 1 control in a nutshell. Then you're always going to give them restrictions. Just think type 1, most constrictive, most restrictive. Type 3, least restrictive, most permission to engage whatever you want, basically. You guys copy that? Yep. Yep. Another way of uh, using type 3 control is basically saying, hey... Everything within the grid square of 040107 to the east to the 045107, so those that five chunk of blocks right there, everything in that area is 
declared enemy. Everything. Have at it, basically. All right. That, so just think of that and just say, hey, we're going to clear you in on multiple passes or you're going to have, you know, we're going to request uh, at your discretion, we're going to request all your gun runs focused on those lo on that location before we extract or we're about to hit that town. So let's say we're, we're doing pr uh, um, preemptive fires on a target. Let's say we want to soften that target up before we engage it. That's how I would do it. Make sense? But you always want to deconflict yourself from that from that position. Um, so let's segue now into how we get those cords and why we have this equipment that we have and how we're going to mark the target. So I know a lot of guys were asking about what Bakken grids. Sorry. So let's talk about how we can talk an aircraft onto a target and how we're going to basically derive coordinates on a piece of paper that I can pass to a ground or, or an aircraft. What's what's one way? What's the best way that I could possibly or what how you would think of getting coordinates uh, from anything to an aircraft? Radio. Radio. OK. Any other suggestions? Visually marking it. Visually marking it. How about asking? Ask a, ask your ground force commander. Say, hey, dude, what do you have for me? What what do you need neutralized right now? I guarantee you, he's gonna say, "All right, dude, my one one, you know, my uh, squ one one squads at this grid. They're taking contact 500 meters north of that. You plot that on your map and you derive those coordinates from there. Just ask, ask the ground force commander. Okay. Ask the aircraft. You know, hey, dude, yeah, I saw three T62s in the open. Okay, what grids? He passes you the grids. You just now have your grids. All right, those are ways of thinking outside of the box and deriving coordinates for your targets. Um, another way is visually looking at it. So if everybody looks outside and we see that control tower and I see it on my map and I get my Vector 2 out and you guys power on the radio, or not the radio, the battery. Yeah. Let's see, why am I not switching? Here we go. So from my, oh, I'm out of batteries. Okay. Anyways, regardless, <laughs> let's say I, I visually see that ground or that control tower, two, five, five. and I see that. Yeah. Okay. So it's 255 meters away, but I can visually see that on my map. Who can give me a grid from our position to that? It is in uh... zero four seven one zero two. Perfect. So you use your map and you see distinguishing, you know, buildings on your map, and you just pull grids from there. That's another way of doing it. How now, put, go ahead. So how do you put the batteries in? Or is it meant to come up with some sort of display? You press you R. Oh, okay. You may need to grab one out of the box. Thanks. Yeah. You should yeah. only need one or two, but don't worry about it. If you don't have it, don't worry about it. I, uh, if anyone needs one, I have some extras. All right, so the, I'm, like I said, this is very rudimentary. We could use a SOFLAM tied up to the dagger. We could use a vector tied up to the dagger and pull cords from there. But battery and technologies fail. So I need to be able to, I need to know that you guys can literally look at a map or ask somebody and get coordinates from that. Um, like I said, technology fails. It's nice to have, but I don't count on it. Now what else do we have? Uh, we have friendly center cast. How many people saw that in the forums and were really curious about it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. All right. So, what do you guys think friendly centric cast is? Just throw a, a rough definition out there for me. Well, it's cast where the uh, uh, you give targets oriented based on a uh, friendly position. Okay, so we are at grid zero four nine one zero zero, right? I know Ooh. that as my friendly position. And the aircraft need to be basically talked on in my position. Let's say I give them a grid, and we're taking heavy contact north 800 meters to the or to the northwest at that that control tower, or 255 meters northwest to that control tower. And I need that aircraft eyes on my position. You know the best way to do that? If I could ever nope. get my smoke grenades out. Boom! Pop of smoke. White smoke on the deck. Hog one one reference grid zero four or uh, four nine one one zero zero. White smoke is on the deck. Enemy is northwest eight hundred meters or two hundred fifty five meters, whatever it is. 
Hog 1 1 calls back. Hog 1 1's contact your white smoke. Visual targets northwest 255 meters at the control tower. Okay, I have now oriented my aircraft in position or referenced him to a target on the ground. He sees the white smoke. I basically give him, hey, Hog 1 1. Fires are going to be, expect fires east to west, east to west only. So you don't want them to shoot a gun over your head, right? You want them to shoot them, shoot their gun perpendicular, or horizontal to your location. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's friendly centered cast in a nutshell. Another way of getting friendly centered cast is saying, you basically turn, we're going to go into the nine line here in a second, but this is just a way of deriving coordinates is basically saying from my position 800 meters to the northwest that's your target he sees your position marks at 800 meters to the northwest he says contact target at grid whatever whatever hey dude perfect we're referenced on the same thing we're on the same sheet of music we are now good for friendly centric cast okay makes sense yeah clear as mud one question Okay, so let's say any mini money mo. Somebody has a question. It sounds like. Yeah, go. Am I quiet or something? Can you hear him, Fluffer? Yeah, what's up, ma'am? Uh, your uh, cent uh, friendly center cast. Uh, do you put it in the nylon or in the remarks? Uh, we're about to get into that here in one second. Um, so we're gonna run two drills here, and I need two volunteers. Anybody? Anybody at all? Who wants to be the be the best JTAC in the world? All right, <laughs> come over here. From this position, reference the house directly to the west of us. You see that with the the guard shack? I see the uh, vehicle factory here. No, 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 the west, west, like maybe 400 meters or so. See the red house, the triangle-shaped roof? Due west from my position, roughly bearing 250. Get your compass out, look at 250. Might be brown for you. It's like a barn. Yeah, it's like a triangle. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything red. It's by the <laughs> brown, red, the house at 250. It's the only building over there. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's on the air. All right, I thought we were talking farther out. All right, All right. let's say I was Hog 1 1 and you were taking contact from that building. How would you talk me onto it? Well, it doesn't I... have to be friendly centric, it can be whatever way you want to do it. I'd probably, uh, let's see here, that's only. That's only not too far. It ranges in at 400 meters away, so I'd probably load a uh, smoke shot into the turbo launcher and put a smoke right on top of it, and then tell the aircraft, "All right, hey, target on the uh, smoke. You got friendlies at uh, 400 meters uh, east of that location. So come in. I don't know, south to north and north to south." Okay, uh, so well, we'll get into that with the nine line, but basically all I needed to do for for you to do was to basically give me chords, or be able to talk me onto that, not just not getting into the nine line portion, but being able to talk me on as an aircraft to that position. So can you give me grids to that, or you can use friendly centered casts from your position? Well, I guess I would give her. Uh... So what would that be? Our current grid reference, and then tell him that, uh, like, 400 meters uh, southwest of our location, target is marked. Some, or something of that nature, right? So you could say okay, our okay. position's at 049100, and the compound that we're looking at is at grid uh, 045098 uh, to the reference a north-south running road on the west side of that road. There's a compound. He's going to say contact, right? He's going to say, I see that target. I see that road. He is not uh, oriented yep, on that target. I think of is using the road. Since exactly. So you use what you really have, right? You see that standby. big road where you say, hey, uh, Hog 1-1, one, one, reference the big fucking airstrip running down the middle of this airbase. To the west of that, you will see a compound directly to the west of that uh, reference another northeast or north to south running road. West of that, 
He's gonna call contact. Okay, I, I am oriented on that target now. That's your target. Used terrain features to basically, if I'm at a god's eye view and I can see your north-south running road, it's gonna stand out pretty high at 3,000 feet, right? So Definitely. you want to use your tools. You want to be, like I said, thinking outside of the box and using that type of stuff. Because grid reference, grid references are nice and everything, but you know, you you might not be able to get grids right on the spot. If I could visually talk them onto that, then sure. Um, another good method that you said was pop, dude, shoot a 203 at it. All right. Everybody shoot a 203 at it. You may want to go over smoke the grenade, uh, smoke grenade. Locality bit. We referenced that at 400 meters, right, roughly? So, yeah. tie it in. You're all <laughs> short. Throw a split grenade anyway. All right, that's good. You don't, I mean, you're not gonna hit the target directly with your 203, right? I don't think I'm good, that good of a shot. But if I can get it close, and I can say Hog 1-1, one, one, reference red smoke, west, 200 meters to that, compound in the open, packs, engaging us, call, call contact. He's going to say, hey, dude, yeah, I see that target. I see that target west of the smoke. Okay, that's your that's your mark. That's your tally, call tally target. Make sense? Clear as mud? Yeah. Okay. Another option of talking an, an aircraft onto that target. Um, now, let's move on to the nine line. All right, so we've we've gone over what a type what type controls there are. We've gone over um, nine line employment and basically, or I'm sorry, how to get those coordinates, how to talk to the ground force commander and say, hey, what do you want me to engage? Or hey, I see targets of opportunity here. Or you know, the aircraft says, hey, dude, I see three two sixty twos in the open at this grid. Those are ways of acquiring your target. Now you want to engage the target. How are we going to do that? It's with the nine line. So who's familiar with the nine line? Me. Okay. Here. Who's unfamiliar with the nine line? Who's never seen one before? Me. Okay. So let's think of it this way. Nine line. Low down, skinny on it. Nine line is basically how you're going to instruct the aircraft on how to engage that target. And it's obviously a nine line, so there's nine lines of format to use. Um, we'll go into each step of the nine line process. So you have step one, IP which is called the initial point that's where you where the where you want the aircraft to hold that before you before they engage so let's say that compound at grid 045098 is our target of op, or our target mark you guys get your yep, maps out I reference that you see that compound one at the at the mark yep all right that is our mark Let's say we want to separate ourselves from that aircraft because we're thinking three steps ahead here that we don't want that aircraft to fly east to west over us, right? We want them to offset. So let's say our offset point is roughly here. Reference the map, you guys see IP Alpha? To the north of the airfield? Negative. Native. All right, I got eyes on. Reference grid 039110. That's IP Alpha. Mark it on your map. You guys got that marked? All right, can you repeat grid, please? Okay, by mark zero green, three nine one one zero. It okay. should be marked as IP Alpha in green and a black X. All right, thanks. All right. Generally, when we give an IP, that's where I want the aircraft to. When they check on initially with the briefing, let's say we're in the briefing screen, right? And we've hashed out that we have three A10s on station that are going to be on station. I want them to direct one point before they even check on with me. So in the briefing, before they even check on, I say, hey, Hog one, Hog two, Hog three. Uh, proceed to IP Alpha once we load in and check in when, with me once you're on station. Make sense? That's your IP. Mm -hmm. Distance, all right, so heading and distance. I don't really care about that because targets change. That target at compound one in, you know, 30 minutes from now might be a different target. It might be that hangar at 040, 
one zero seven. Makes sense. So yeah. I usually don't I, I don't reference a heading or a distance, but what I do reference is target elevation, and the the description and the target location. Why is that important? Because I need the aircraft to know what I want to hit. So let's say our elevation marker is three three uh, three three nine elevation. You guys see that on the yeah. map at compound yes. one? That's yep. line four. Target description, compound, whatever you want to call it. Infantry in the open, three T-62s. Whatever you see there, that is your target description. Target location. Obviously, who can tell me what the target location is for that? Uh, the grid. The grid. Yeah, yeah right there. Zero four five two zero nine eight. That is zero four five zero nine or zero four five zero nine eight, right? Yeah. What else can we use? Our friendly center cast that we just gave him. It says that we initially talked him on and we popped two or three smoke to the west of that. We popped two or three smoke mm -hmm. to the west of that, and he is oriented on that target. Okay, I'm capture target. Where you know I see your target. Okay, not applicable. Or one two three and a four three three nine. Infantry in the open, line six, previously marked compound, grid 045098, something to that effect, all right? Type mark. I always tell them your discretion because we're not going to be using SOFLAMs. We're not going to be using ground-based less designators. They're always going to be designating their own target. Friendly location. Who can give our friendly location in, in conjunction to that target that we're about to, is, uh, about to strike? 400 meters east. Right, 400 meters east. Perfect. I thought in terms of a uh, mark type, uh, couldn't you say something for that, like red smoke? You could, yeah. You don't have to use a soflam. Let's say we're at night and you say, hey, target mark is my laser on the, uh, you know, my IR pointer on my, on my. Or, uh, uh, or like reference strobe or something. Exactly. You can use anything. Uh, you can also use for the location of friendlies. Let's say friendly location as that green smoke. Something to that effect. You can use. You don't have to give grids. You can like, say friendlies are marked with green smoke at this time. That's like your target maybe, friendly uh, mark. Friendlies marked with IR strobes or something. Exactly. Anything. Okay. Anything that you want to use to mark your position. Awesome. Um, what are the chances I can uh, get up this break here? Go ahead. Take a break. All right. Be back in like two seconds. Mm -hmm. You're this. not going to miss anything. Um, but for the egress. Obviously, who can tell me what a good egress heading is? It doesn't matter. Just use one. 180. 180. Let's say that there is a ZSU-23 at grid 050091. Um, 240. East or west, right? Away from the south. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you're not going to want your aircraft to fly over a threat, basically, is all I'm trying to get at. Um, another way, of, let's say there wasn't a ground threat, you, and your egress point, you want them to go back to IP Alpha, you just tell them, egress IP Alpha, your discretion. That way he can go whatever heading he wants to get back to IP Alpha as soon as he can. Clears mud? Yeah. Makes sense? Makes sense. All right. Restrictions. Restrictions are solely up to you and they are what's what might save or break your ass uh restrictions you give them a let's say they reference ip alpha and you want them to you don't want them to fly over you right because they're obviously going to be attacking from ip alpha you're going to give them a restricted run-in heading or you're going to say northwest to southeast something to that nature you're never going to say hey i want you to fly over me with this 30 millimeter gun and engage in line with me make sense um, yep. Another way of deconfliction, let's say the 047 Easting, you guys reference that on your map. Friend, do not engage anything to the east of the 047 Easting. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. Hey, firm. Okay, so those are restrictions, all right? Another form of restriction is a TOT or a time on target. Let's say that you get your watch out. Do I have a watch? Okay, so reference, uh, let's call it 0453-ish. That's about what everybody has on their clock. Close enough, yeah. Okay, so let's call 0440, or 0443 is our current time. Restrictions. 
Our TOT of zero four, or I'm sorry, zero five hundred, or I'm sorry, no, that's zero three forty. No, I can't tell time. Zero three fifty three. That's our time. Our TOT is zero four hundred. Make sense? Yep. Yep. So time on target. That means I want you to strike that target at that time, or all fires will be ceased post zero four hundred. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So we've gone over the basic nonline procedures. I think Sinks put it in the actual channel itself. Yeah, um, I put a Dropbox link for a PDF file that you guys can download and use as a template. Always oh, have. If you're ever gonna slot as a JTAC, you need to bring at least like ten sheets of nine line papers with you, at all times. Make sense? Yeah, and right, I'm back. So. Okay, Hellhound. He DC. Oh no, he's back over there. Hellhound. Hellhound. Uh, you wanna hop in an A10 for me and go fly around on channel 3 long range? Yeah, I got you. How do I spawn one? Go Just up go to an aircraft factory and hit 2. It's H, I thought. Wrong way, oh, wrong way, go left. The last one to the south. Direct south of our position. What loadout? Standard A10 loadout's fine. You can't change it, I don't think. Yeah, you can. Okay. You to the, that, uh, little, that little factory thing just to the southeast of that aircraft station, you pull it up next to that and you can change the loadout. Alright guys. Can you guys hear me while the aircraft's taking off? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can hear you from our voice. Alright, uh, we're we'll all just talking on the radio while he's fucking around over there. Um, so what have we gone through so far? We've gone through basic theory of cast, who we are, what we do. You guys have a good handle on that? Affirm. Okay, uh, next week went into basically what a fighter to fact check in, what a fact a fighter is. Um, also we went into getting coordinates for our targets and how to basically ask for coordinates from the ground force commander. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Alright. Um. So we've gone over how to acquire a target, how to pass that information. We've gone over type controls and nine lines. Make sense? Yep. Got their deconfliction and clearance authority, and now we're going to go into the demonstration process of how to basically call it an airstrike. Hey, Hellhound, you got me on channel 3? I got you. Alright, proceed to IP Alpha. Your call sign is going to be Hellhound 1 1. I'll be Flupper 6 9 controlling you. Copy. All right, so I'm going to give you guys a good demo pro or a demo of an, of an actual strike. Um, so the scenario is basically what I just briefed. Um, we're taking fire from the west 400 meters, and we want to call an inner strike on that. You guys are all going to have an opportunity to do this uh, in a minute, um, but I'm going to demo pro it for you guys so you guys have a good hand on it. Fluffer 6-9, Hellhound 1-1 one, one on station, IT Alpha uh, 1200 to local. Say ready, fighter check in. Hellhound 1 1, Fluffer 6 9, send your check in. Hellhound 1 1, mission 1 2 3 4, 1 times Alpha 10. Overhead IP Alpha. Playtime is uh, 6 0 Mike. Loadout is as follows 1 times gun, 2 times AGM 6 5, 2 times AIM 9, 4 times GBU 12. Able to self-designate. How copy? Fluffer 69 copies. Self-designation. 60 mics play time. Abort will be in the clear. Say when ready for situation update. Hellhound 1-1 one, one, ready to copy. Hellhound 1-1. One, one, Fluffer 69 situation update. Alpha 1. Threats. Packs in the open at grid. Break. Grid 045-098. Sized element. 
platoon sized enemy element located at that grid. We've been taking spread of contact throughout the day. Friendlies are approximately 400 meters to the east, established at a CCP. Artillery is cold. We'll call with deconfliction if it goes hot. Clearance authorities through Fluffer 69, Ground Force Commanders, call signs Jackal 46. Warnings requested, restrictions and remarks per 9 line. How copy? Hellhound 1 1, copies all. Hellhound 1 1, take Angels 2 0. Orient your target, grid 045098, call contact. Contact. Hellhound 1 1, Fluffer 69, stand by, gonna work with the Ground Force Commander, get you a 9 line. Uh, we'll be requesting one by gun run and approximately two mics. Hellhound 1 1, copy. All right, so you guys hear all that? Make sense? Yeah, that was that was fucking yeah, good. Yeah, kind of. I heard it. it. Didn't make sense, but I heard it. It's pretty good. Practice makes perfect, and I guarantee you that after you know a couple of missions and screwing up, and that's how I learned is I screwed up a lot. But I guarantee you guys will get to that point where you you'll be as proficient. Um, but biggest thing so, here, uh, go ahead. I was gonna say when uh, so like when you were in uh, Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, what happened when you, like, first went out there and you messed up a nine line and the pilot just snicker at you, or? No, no, I didn't call in my own nine lines or airstrikes. We had JTACs for that. Well, I'm not a okay. JTAC in real life. I'm a sensor operator. I'm basically like a glorified navigator, co-pilot, and weapon system dude. Okay. But I work with JTACs on a regular basis. Hellhound 1-1, one, one, Hellhound 1-1, one, one, Flipper 6-9, radio check. Hellhound 1-1, one, one, 5 by 5 Hellhound 1-1, one, one, Fluffer 6-9, staying ready for 9-line. Hellhound 1-1, one, one, prepare to copy 9-line. Hellhound 1-1, one, one, Fluffer 6-9, this will be type 2 control. 1-2-3-N-A, uh, 4-3-3-9, three, three, MSL, 3, packs in the open, engaging us from the west. Grid 045098, your laser, friendlies. Marked with green smoke, 400 meters to the east. Egress, your discretion, back to the wheel. Warners requested, one by gun run on grid 045098. Call in with direction for clearance. Hellhound 1143396045098. Eight, friendlies green smoke, 400 meters east. One times gun run, uh, call one in. Roger, uh, forgot to give you a restricted run-in heading there. Uh, restricted run-in from IP Alpha 360 to 180. Do not engage anything to the east of the 146 Easting. How copy? Restriction 03, uh, 360 to 180. Nothing east of uh, 146. Say in uh, Easting. Uh, 146 Easting. Yellow smoke is on the deck. Mark for friendly position. Call in with direction for clearance. Copy. So I've deconflicted myself, and he knows where I'm at, right? <laughs> Hellhound 1-1's one in from the north. Hellhound 1-1, one one, Fluffer 6-9, cleared hot. I'm a little confused. You said, uh, 146 East thing? Yeah, he meant 046. Okay. Or 046, sorry. I don't, uh... Since that. when does the A-10 have self-designation? Hellhound 1 1's off to the east. Hellhound 1 1, Fluffer 6 9, return back to the wheel, IP Alpha. I see another A 10 up in the air. That's a UAV. Two? It's a UAV. Uh, okay. uh, AI, I think. So, any questions about that? Hellhound 1 1, IP Alpha. Roger, stand by one. I'm going to give these guys a little briefing. You can fly on your own for a little bit. I'll call you back. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, sure. You said one, two, three, and A. I understand what that means. I'm just curious, like, uh, could you explain why you do that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, when you checked on initially, he already knew that he was supposed to go to IP Alpha, right? Yep. So why do I need to tell him to go back to IP Alpha? Okay. <laughs> That's why it's an A. That's just okay. what I was getting for it. Gotcha. All so right. It's just like the same time, basically. Yeah. So that was uh, just a rough, you know, a rough nine and, line uh, and an engagement. 
Uh, and the reason you didn't give him two and three is because uh, he's at the uh, at the IP. He could already I, see yeah, the target. Yeah, he's at the IP, so. and I was going to give him a restriction anyways, right? Okay, so and so it's like if he can already see the target from his IP, then you don't have to tell him the bearing and the distance because mm -hmm. he can fucking see it. Exactly. He's trying to take. Plus, he's trying to take ten UAV. Plus, I'm giving him a restriction anyways with the nine line. Okay. No, All I right. did hear somewhere in there you said 4339. Was that actually, in fact, uh, line 4, line 339 MSL? What about when you said 4339? Oh, well, I mean, I so usually don't, but yeah, it was just a, a screw up on my end. Okay. But yeah, usually uh, that's another good point. Um, normally, I don't say the line that I'm giving because it could interfere with the actual comm. Right, so, okay. Uh, let's say, for example, a, that's a good example of that. Uh, a nine line would not. It would say, you know, it would sound something like Type Two Control One Two Three NA Three Three Nine MSL Packs in the Open Zero Four Nine Zero Six Eight Your Your Laser Friendly is marked with yellow smoke. Egress to the south. All right, that's about as good as nine line. But the thing is, you guys are still learning and you're new. So by all means, use the line numbers. Just say line one, line two, line three NA, line four, three three four MSL, line five targets in the open something of that nature just make it so it makes sense to you you don't have to sound cool on the radio mm -hmm. all right so who do we have who wants to call in an airstrike uh, I'll give it a shot who is that all right. Gabe. that's good okay. all right Gabe take out that air control tower and don't kill us okay um can I uh, like do you want me to do another check-in or should I just Calhoun 114469, I'm passing the control off to Gabe at this time. Uh, his call sign will be Gabe69. Uh, stand by for his radio call. Uh, he's going to want to do another full fighter fact check in. Copy. Just take your time. Okay. Guys. Uh. Hellhound 11, this is Gabe 69, uh, comm check. Gabe 69, Hellhound 11, 5 by 5 uh, ready to check in. Copy. Hellhound 11, this is Gabe 69, uh, need a ordinance check. Hellhound 11, mission number 1234, 1 times Alpha 10, Charlie. Overhead, IP Alpha Angels 1.5. Playtime is 6-0 mics, loadout 1 times gun, 4 times GBU-12, 2 times AGM-65, uh, 14 FFAR rockets, 2 times AIM-9. Able to self-designate, how copy all? Hellhound 11 at Gabe 69, copy all, uh, stand by for situation uh, report. So did he say he has uh, missiles, or are those air-to-air -air only? Hellhound 11, Escape 69, uh, have situation reports, A1 ready to copy. Hellhound 11, ready to copy. Uh, Hellhound 11, Gabe 69, situation as follows. Uh, squad size element at a control tower at air airfield. Uh, current uh, enemy location 047102. Uh, friendly have set up a uh, control point at uh, 049100. Uh, Enemy's uh, squad size element uh, will be uh, calling in, uh, need uh, air support, uh, expect guns, and friendly uh, marked by uh, smoke. Okay. 